Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Stars daily sports podcast. It is Monday, March 29th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. In any other year, we'd spend today talking about the Final Four lineup, but we're only down to the Elite Eight. Two games tonight, Baylor, Arkansas, and Houston, Oregon State, and two on Tuesday, Gonzaga, USC, and Michigan, UCLA. Of course, the NCAA tournament schedule has been altered this year because of the pandemic. Kansas beat writer Jesse Newell stops by to talk college hoops, and we don't just limit it to Division I. How about those Northwest Missouri State Bearcats? They won their third NCAA Division II championship in the last four tournaments on Saturday in walkover fashion. We talk about Coach Ben McCollum's program and his future in Maryville. After a break, we switch gears to talk Kansas football. Did the Jayhawks' next starting quarterback just transfer in? Okay, let's get started talking with Jesse Newell. Jesse, it's the NCAA tournament. We just we're in the middle of the the regional round, right? We've got um, we're down to the Elite Eight, four games to go, and doesn't include a local. I guess Baylor, Big Twelve, that that's local. Um, Arkansas, SEC, local, but but no, you know, no Kansas. It feels a little empty without KU in the Sweet Sixteen. Any of these four remaining games intrigue you? Oregon State, Houston, Arkansas, Baylor, USC, Gonzaga, UCLA, Michigan. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of weird how it kind of falls in that way where a lot of the good teams are playing this, a lot of the not good ones, and uh, there's going to be some heavy favorites to go to the Final Four. But, you know, obviously for for obvious reasons, I think the the USC-Gonzaga matchup is, is going to be something to watch. Um, we all talked about it, sort of how uh, that West region, when it first came out, even looking at Kansas' path, like, wow, even if, if Kansas was able to get by Iowa and able to get by USC, that it would still face Gonzaga to get to the Final Four. So uh, that will be fascinating. You know, uh, Gonzaga has been kind of an unstoppable force so far in this tournament. And uh, USC obviously is showing how good interior defense and how well that can play in a tournament like this. And I, I think I saw Ken Pomeroy tweet about how this is the uh, the top two-point defense against the top two-point offense. So uh, that'll be fascinating to watch as well. But yeah, other than that, it's, it's sort of a crazy tournament. There were so many upsets early in the Oral Roberts of the Worlds, but uh, now it seems kind of like a clear path for it to be, you know, the three number ones and a number two potentially making the final four. And those could be great games too. But yeah, I'm probably most intrigued by Gonzaga USC. And that, that one's on Tuesday, along with UCLA, Michigan. Tonight, we've got uh, the Oregon State-Houston game and then Arkansas-Baylor. I want to ask you something about, you know, Houston intrigues me a little bit, but Kelvin Sampson's the coach there, and their best player is Quentin Grimes, former former KU player. Is Quentin Grimes the best player? Did he have the best college career of somebody who transferred away from Kansas? I know didn't prepare you for that question, but I couldn't come up with somebody who as a transfer ended up with a better career than Quentin Grimes. I don't think so. Yeah. I I mean, it's not coming to the top of my head and I'm sure there might be people yelling at the podcast right now, like, Hey, you idiot, here's the person. But uh, you know, looking at him, he's ninth on Ken Palm's player of the year ranking list. So, I mean, a legitimate all America type of guy. And you know, this is a, this is one Blair, you have to feel good for him to start off with. I mean, he was a guy that obviously very ballyhooed coming to Kansas. Bill Self was talking him up when he came. He played on that Team USA team for Bill Self in the summer when Bill Self coached it. So there were really high expectations for him. It didn't work out. It seemed like he sort of wanted to play point guard and wasn't getting that opportunity with Devon Dotson. And then because he was moved to the wing, he was kind of had to become a spot up shooter and he didn't make his threes like he is now, which obviously if Kansas had seen him make 38, 39% of his threes, whatever the case may be, there probably would have been more of a spot for him there. But uh, I think in saying this, I've heard a lot of people, you know, and you see this a lot on social media or out on the internet and kind of grumble like, Hey, sure. been nice for Bill self to, to keep him and, and all these sorts of things. And obviously there was a lot of things that happened behind the scenes with that, but he did return back closer to home with Houston. And I do want to say this, If it wasn't his mind, again, he's not playing point guard for Houston. So, I mean, that's not the plan. The plan didn't work out at Houston either for him. But if if it was the plan at Kansas, if that's what he thought he was going to do, Devon Dotson came back that next year for Kansas. And so if it was in his mind that he needed to go somewhere where he could play point guard and Houston potentially told him that, there was no spot for him at Kansas. You know what I mean? Like Devon Dotson was going to leave that team. So 
Kansas could have made maybe a long-term decision to keep Quentin Grimes over Devon Dotson, but look how it turned out for Kansas. I mean, Devon Dotson returned, Yudoka Azubuki returned, Devon, or Quentin Grimes left, and KU was the number one team in the nation. Consensus number one team was going to be the number one team in the NCAA tournament, and then COVID called it off. So I think sometimes, you know, things kind of get twisted a little bit where it's like, well, if KU would just would have quit, kept Quentin Grimes, it'd have been good this year. Well, Maybe, but if you have to look at the situations and how they happened. And so I think this is really one of those where it worked out well for both sides. The unfortunate part for Kansas is that Houston got Quentin Grimes in a year when there's an NCAA tournament. And Kansas got its really good year with Devon Dots and Yudoka Azubuki when there wasn't an NCAA tournament. So sometimes things turn out the way they, they do. And uh, really, Kansas had no way of getting around that. But uh, would Kansas basically have, have turned you know, a, a transferred Quentin Grimes into an overall number one seeded team in the NCAA tournament, I bet your bottom dollar they would have. And that's sort of the trade that Kansas made. And again, it didn't work out in the end, but that's based off of some circumstances that KU never could have predicted. Yeah, and you mentioned Grimes as a, a top 10 in, in, in uh, Pomeroy. He's also a finalist for Jerry West, uh, one of the five finalists for Jerry West Award, which is for the nation's top sh- shooting guard. So, <laughs> listen, if the Cougars end up in the Final Four, uh, it will be because Quentin Grimes had an outstanding season for for that for Kelvin Sampson's program. Real quick, uh, when you talk about the uh, – what, what, who did you say the shooting guard was, the, the list for Quentin Grimes? Uh, Jerry West Award. Jerry West, okay. So I vote for the Carl Malone Award. So it is, it is a hoot every single year, I have to say, being on that committee because – uh, for those, just a quick peek behind the curtain, because I, I find it fascinating every year that I'm on it. Maybe, maybe I'm not supposed to talk about this, but I will. Um, because it's named after Carl Malone, they have a conference call, and Carl Malone gets on there. Um, so it's it's pretty fascinating. And then the five coaches of the players, uh, because it's the power forward, Carl Malone power forward, uh, the five coaches of the players that are finalists come on and talk as well. So um, it was great because I had this call last week, and – um, Carl is, he speaks his mind. He'll, he'll talk about whatever he wants to talk about and, and go off on a little tangents, but Mark few, uh, opened up the talking for drew Timmy, you know, trying to talk up his guy. And about five minutes in Carl Malone was talking to Mark few about his fishing excursion to Alaska with John Stockton. So that was all of us listening on this call. It's supposed to be about Drew Timmy and how great of a player he is. And all of a sudden, Mark Few and uh, Carl Miller talk about fishing in Alaska with John Stockton. So anyway, it's a great experience. I, you, you mentioned that. I just thought it was funny. But uh, supposedly, Bill Self was on that same committee. So uh, me and Bill Self were voting for the best power forward. And uh, we'll see who that turns out to be here in, in a week or so. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, I didn't know if we were supposed to talk about these things, but since it's already out there, so I'm, I'm on the West Committee too. And so, there you go. Yeah, so it's Jerry West on the conference call talking to, <laughs> um, you know, let's see, Mark, it was Mark Few because Joel, I can't pronounce his last name. Ayayi, yeah. Ayayi, who, who I think is a terrific under, and an underrated player for Gonzaga. He was a finalist, Macy Oteague, uh, a finalist. And so Scott Drew was on the call and, you know, it, it was it was great to listen to him. Um, Duarte for uh, for Oregon, so we heard uh, Dana Altman. Um, so it's an hour of listening to, you know, the type of conversations that we're not often privy to, and uh, you know, really being honest about breaking down their players. Of course, they're try- all the coaches are trying to sell their guys, and um, but anyway, I, I find it interesting, and I, I I enjoy the conversation every year. Okay. It's really good. I, I do want to mention this too, and, and this is sort of behind the scenes as well. You do get a mix, a smattering of the coaches that are on, and then like uh, for the one that I did, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Robinson Earl was on there uh, on the list, but Jay Wright was getting ready for his game against Baylor. So he had like a recorded message, which works. Um, so I, I did they also think it's fascinating when you hear sometimes there's assistant coaches on there, sometimes there's head coaches on there. It kind of depends on who it is, but I, I'll never forget a couple years ago, Diedrich Lawson was on there for Kansas, and that was the year 2019, the Auburn game, the one we just talked about when Quentin Grimes was on the team. And um, it was almost all assistant coaches, and it was I think it was either the day after, I think it was the literal day after KU lost to Auburn or the second day after. And so I thought, you know, here's gonna come Norm Roberts. You know, of course, you know, I mean, they should do that. Sure enough, Bill Self pops on that phone and I, I'll have to go back and look who won that year. But I think it was, was it uh, whoever it was, there was one clear cut person 
who was zero – there was zero doubt they were winning that award. I mean, like, it was, like, overwhelming. I can't remember if it was Zion or not, but it was someone like that where, like, there is no doubt at all that – and still, Bill Self popped up on that call, talked up Deidre Gloss for 10 minutes. I, it's one of those things, like you said, conversations we're not privy to, but also things behind the scenes that we're not privy to because I just thought it was really cool. Bill Self had no reason to be on that call, and he knew his guy was not going to win, but – he took the time, came on, talked 10 or 12 minutes about Diedrich Lawson, hoping to get him a few votes. Knew it wasn't going to matter, but uh, still vouching for his guy. So it's it's interesting to hear some of those things as well to just to see what coaches do for their players. Yeah, after after a lousy loss, too. They, yeah, that's too. I mean, they had just gotten killed by Auburn, right. too. Yep. Right. Well, um, uh, sticking with uh, with uh, college hoops, the other story, a uh, couple other storylines to, to discuss. First of all, the transport portal is up and running and very, you know, very busy these days. And Gary Bedore wrote, and we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we will link to his story in the show notes here, but wrote for this morning that um, Brandon McKissick, the, the KC Ruse, as they're known now, UMKC, as they were formerly known, the guard has, um, has Kansas as one of six finalists, including Missouri and Kansas State. You know, he McKissick played point guard for uh, the KC Ruse the last under Billy Donlin each of the last two years. They he, Donlin moved him from a from a wing to the point guard. So it seems like if if McKissick ends up choosing Kansas, that could be your starting point guard next year. It could be, and they they are obviously in the market for a point guard. They were in on Tyson Walker, the Northeastern uh, graduate transfer. He en- ended up going to Michigan State. Ty Ty Washington is a top 50 recruit that's still available as a point guard. They're still in on him. And uh, yeah, Brandon McKissick, it sounds, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, smoke to that fire, if you will. So um, potentially this week you would think that uh, he might choose Kansas and yeah, for Bill Self, it, it makes sense. um, If you're looking at sort of the roster construction and uh, trying to figure out the pieces for next year, Dewan Harris played great down the stretch, but, is it a sure thing for Kansas? Not really. And one of the ways that Kansas really struggled, I'd, I'd be interested to kind of dive a little bit more into this. I would assume if uh, McKissick played point guard for the the Ruse that he'd be in a lot of ball screen situations, but KU just didn't have uh, very much success in those areas. Uh, Marcus Garrett could get to the rim occasionally, but like not the same as Devon Dotson. He also wasn't as good in the pick and roll making reads as a guy like a Tyshawn Taylor, some of those guys of Bill Self's past. So if you can get a guy who can get in a ball screen, make good reads, find shooters, I mean, that would just help this team so much. They've got two good spot-up shooters in Ochai Abaji and Christian Brown, who I think will shoot better next year. You've got a big man in Dave McCormick who can at least hard roll. You know what I mean? There's a potential for a lob there if you uh, if you see him in the right spot, but they just didn't have guys who could initiate that offense. So it's kind of been a missing piece for Kansas. So McKissick's numbers, he has good assist numbers, so that seems like it's good with a point guard. And then obviously uh, didn't shoot a ton of threes this past year, but but made a good percentage. So uh, we will see what happens with uh, w- with those guys, but um, yeah, McKissick seems like a a very a very very high likelihood uh, of being a Jayhawk. We'll just have to see how this whole thing plays out. And he was the Summit League Defensive Player of the Year this year, so second team All Conference. So okay, that gets we, people's attention too. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yes, yeah, absolutely it would. So hey, did you happen to watch uh, Northwest Missouri State uh, when it's? third division two title in the last four tournaments on Saturday. I did not watch it, but I have watched a lot of their film. And then obviously I'm pretty familiar with Ben McCollum, uh, who is the Northwest Missouri state coach. And they've won, as you put it, Blair, they've won three of the last five years, but there was no tournament last year. So they've won three of the last four tournaments. So um, yeah, (laughs) I, I know Ben from a long time ago, he was actually an assistant coach in Emporia state for, uh, David Moe way back in the day. And that was one of his first assistant jobs uh, before he took over Northwest at 27 years old, but their offense, Blair, I've got to read this. It is. So just to give a, again, a little peek behind the curtain, when I do the quick scout preview, I like to go on synergy and they kind of have everything set up in the play types. Okay. Hey, there's spot up, there's pick and roll ball handler, there's, there's pick and roll roll man, there's cut, there's post up, there's transition. There's all these different ways you can score an offense. So 
it gives you like a nice overview because it gives you like the percentiles of where these teams are scoring. So, okay, you know, Kansas, they were not good with pick and roll ball handler. That's exactly what I just told you, but they didn't have a, a, uh, a Sharon Collins or a Tyshawn Taylor that did that. They're pretty good in uh, post up though, because David McCormick's good at that. They were decent spot up because, you know, Chaya Baji could make threes, those sorts of things. I pulled up North Horse West Missouri's numbers um, for all these categories. And uh, let me just go real quick down the road here. Spot up, 91st percentile, excellent rating. Pick and roll ball handler, 97th percentile, excellent rating. Pick and roll roll man, 93rd percentile, excellent rating. Cut, 99th percentile, excellent rating. Post up, 96th percentile, excellent rating. Transition, 99th percentile, excellent rating. Isolation, 93rd percentile, excellent rating. Offensive rebounds, 64th percentile, good. So got to work on those offensive rebounds, Northwest. You're not getting as much efficiency there. Handoff, 96%, excellent rating. Off screen, 95th percentile, excellent rating. Miscellaneous, whatever else they do, 95th percentile, excellent rating. That's all you got, Blair. That, that's the only play types that are available at Synergy. They are excellent in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten 10 of the 11 categories. Um, how is this guy not a Division One head coach? Uh, he is young. He has won three of the last four national championships. It's hard to win national championships. The other coach is commenting how he should be a, or the, that team that they just had as a Division One coach. They play a fun style. They get on transition. They share the ball. I'm sure a lot of people saw that viral clip where they passed it like nine different times with six dribbles, got an open three. Just a, a, a great thing to watch. So, yeah, um, I, I guess I looking at those numbers, I think a lot of people should be on the Ben McComb train, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't gotten a shot at Division One at this point. Probably can be very choosy with his options, but anybody who is young, has an offense like that that's fun to watch and has his team share the ball and has that sense of community like he does, uh, yeah, I would think they're going to get a shot at the next level at some point. His, his background is Iowa. He, he's from the state of Iowa, and uh, but he's M- MIAA, <laughs> right, his, you know, his, his whole coaching career. Uh, and my thing, it would be for him. I mean, again, I, I'm not inside his head, so I have no idea. But uh, the valley would seem like a natural thing, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I think if there was a valley opening, a lot of times they seem to sort of get maybe the retread types that have worked at higher levels, but not. Uh, I know there's always kind of been that stigma, you know, Division two, Division one. But you've seen guys like the John Beelines of the world, where they work works at Division three, and then they go to Division two, works at Division two, and then all of a sudden. You know, they they popped up in Division One and had success there. So we'll see what happens. But again, he's he's around my age. I, I think he's 38, 39. So uh, there should be a lot more coaching in his future. And uh, I know Northwest uh, has taken care of him pretty well while he's there, but I'm, I'm sure he'd love that crack at the next level at some point. And at this point, he probably deserves it. I like the beeline comp because beeline, all he did was win everywhere he went, no matter the level or once he got into the level, he you know, he rose from what Richmond to West Virginia to – to, to Michigan and, and won everywhere he went uh, because he's just a better coach. It's just a matter of, you know, c- can you recruit? Can you, can you get the players? And Beeline obviously did everywhere he went and then coached him up and got to, you know, got to the national championship game with, with them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big I, – I watched the second half of that game and it was a clinic. And uh, it, it, it was it, – it's a marvel to watch – that team. How about he, he lost two two games? He lost twice this year to the same team to Washburn, and um, that's just one of those chalk it up to familiarity and. You know. Well, the one on the uh, like the two thirds <laughs> court shot at the buzzer that went viral on Sports Center top ten all those things. So yeah, yeah, again, there's a lot of volatility in college basketball. We just talk, saw it and talked about it with the brackets. So for them to run the type of offense that. Uh, you hear them always repeated on the on the broadcast because it's true. It's the most efficient offense in college basketball if you're looking at all levels. Uh, it's, it's surprising because, you know, if you think about it, if, if you had a coach like this that had this sort of success three out of four years uh, but did it with a defensive style, maybe you would be like, oh, that's going to be hard to sell to the fan base, you know. Maybe they want, don't want to watch teams grind them down, but it's like, Tell them, watch that 25 second clip of them pass, 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 one dribble, pass, 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 two dribbles, pass, 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 open three. I, I mean, it was fun to watch. I, I mean, it was fun to watch after watching Division One college basketball year. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see where this takes him. But uh, like I said, I, I think if the right opportunity arises somewhere around the valley, uh, we'll see what Ben McClellan can do at the next level. Yeah, listen, Mike Shashevsky sung his praises a couple years ago when. And they, they went to Duke for the exhibition mm-hmm. game and um, Duke led the whole way, but ended up winning by six. And uh, Krzyzewski just opened his press conference by saying, look, we don't play a team like that. You know, we don't see teams like that in the, in the ACC. And, and part of that was, you know, 
you know, they don't see teams as efficient as Northwest Missouri State is and and um, and has helped them win the the three of the four last national titles. So, okay, Jesse, let's take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk some football with you. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Back with Jesse Newell, who covers Kansas for the Kansas City Star and Wichita Eagle. And uh, we were talked to, we spent some time in the last segment t- speaking of the revolving door in college basketball with the transfer portal. There's a bit of a revolving door for Kansas football, Jesse, uh, one in and one out in a rather high profile way this past week. Let's talk about the addition. Um, Kansas picked up a quarterback <laughs> um, last week, and it might even end up being their starting quarterback. How bizarre is that? Yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, so Jason Bean, he's a transfer from North Texas, actually ran a lot of track in high school. So he's known as like a sprinter, like a hundred meter type guy. I think finished third in his class in state of Texas. Uh, that takes some wheels to do that. And uh, throwing wise, I mean, I guess it's been inconsistent, but it's, it's funny when you look at numbers that are inconsistent in other teams compared to Kansas, you know, like his inconsistent was 14 touchdowns and five interceptions for North Texas and starting over half the games last year. So, I mean, if Kansas got 14 touchdowns and five interceptions, they would like, you know, start talking about where the statue is going to go. So it, it is a fascinating pickup. And it's also kind of strange at this point in time, because one, You know, KU has an interim coach in Emmett Jones, but there really has uh, not been any announcement made that he's going to have it for the entire year. So, I mean, if this is something made before a new coach comes in, that's sort of interesting. But again, this is sort of the Dallas metro area. So, and uh, and, uh, Jason talked about, hey, this is uh, a big reason he decided to choose Kansas was he liked the relationship he had with Emmett Jones. So, that's one thing that's fascinating. For two, that KU returns Jalen Daniels, and there was a lot of high hopes for him. He just had no offensive line. I compared it to, I tell people it's like Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl, only he wasn't Patrick Mahomes. You know, like he was running for his life the whole time and was only, you know, I like just turned 18 year old true freshman. So it's going to be hard to pick up things. And, um, you know, so we'll see with that with, with Kansas. Um, again, a lot of people had a lot of helps, high hopes for Jalen Daniels, but this seems to potentially say, hey, you're not the starter. And then the third thing is they just have so many guys on scholarship at quarterback. When you're talking about a team that's trying to build out of a scholarship deficit or a scholarship hole, uh, you know, you don't want to spend six or seven scholarships on, on QBs just because you, you got to get one guy and get it right. So it's KU putting more resources towards that. Obviously, it's worth it if you can get the right guy. But um, yeah, this is fascinating. And um, with being speed, you know, how they want to utilize him, how they want to use him, um, that's kind of interesting as well, but I don't think you take this guy at this point in the year if you don't think he's going to be the starter. So if nothing else, I would say Jason Bean and Jalen Daniels going into next year competing for the starting quarterback job and probably those on a a tier above everybody else. How much eligibility does uh, Jason Bean have? So he should be immediately eligible, and it kind of gets back to the weird, like, uh, how much do you want to say he has? Because he was a sophomore last year, a redshirt sophomore but everybody gets a year back with the pandemic if they want to. But then again, to have that happen, you have to pull a, okay. So I'm going to try to make this simple because it gets confusing. So think about like Mitch Lightfoot this year for KU basketball. Okay. He's coming back to Kansas because his last year was the COVID year and he's not counting against KU's 13 scholarships. Okay. So that means, you know, he's a super senior, doesn't cost KU anything really in a long scheme. For KU football senior, super seniors this year, same thing like Kwame Lasseter, a receiver. He gets an extra year. He does not count against their 85 number, okay? So he just basically is a bonus add-on if they pay a scholarship. Doesn't count for anything. 
for anybody who was a junior last year, if they want to stay on an extra year, if they're senior this year and want to stay on an extra year next year because of COVID, KU has to give them one of the 85 scholarships. Okay. They count against that. So the accounting on this is going to be very different. You know what I mean? Like if you have a backup left guard who wants to stay an extra year, a lot of these schools are going to go, I think we'd rather take the incoming freshman. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to cost them a whole scholarship. The exception though is if Jason Bean is a talented starting quarterback and wants to play with you for three years, it's probably worth the scholarship because we know how important that that quarterback is. So I guess I would say technically he will be most likely a junior on the roster this next year with two years of eligibility remaining. But if he is good and if he is the starting quarterback for Kansas and he gives them the production they hope he gives them, then I think they would be happy to dip into their 85 scholarships and say, we will take one of these and give them to a guy that we know will be a good quarterback in his super senior season if he wants to remain around. So again, a complicated answer for you, Blair, but he has up to three years eligibility remaining. If it doesn't work out, it's likely only going to be two. Okay, that's good information. Good to know. Um, on the uh, on the debit side, uh, uh, the, the highest rated recruit that Kansas Am I right about that? The highest rated recruit that they've ever had, Quay Davis, uh, wide receiver out of uh, going back to the Dallas Metroplex area, Skyline High. Uh, Kansas pulled their offer after a report surfaced that um, he had been involved with um, an alleged sexual uh, or just an assault, not a sexual, but, a, but yeah, a, domestic a, abuse. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Domestic abuse. Right move by Kansas. Was it not? I mean, they, they, they almost had to do this. Well, so. Um, Basically, what happened was, yes, there was a Twitter account that came forward with pictures of a young woman who was in a hospital gown with basically a uh, puffed up eye uh, with some bleeding, bleeding on her lip, those sorts of things. And then this, the same account had photos of Quay Davis and said, how do you make this guy into an idol when these are the sorts of things that happen, you know, and domestic violence, those sorts of things. So KU, when that first came out, said that they would basically do due diligence, go check into it, see what would happen, uh, you know, see what they could find out about it. And then the next day came out and said they couldn't exactly determine everything that had happened, but had enough information to feel that they were not going to move forward with Quay Davis on the roster. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he was, like you said, according to rivals.com, you know, he's top 60 recruit in the nation. Uh, so KU had never gotten a guy that high, at least since the rivals started doing its rankings in 1999. So there was a lot of excitement around him. Uh, but for Kansas, again, you do your due diligence, you, you check into the facts that are available, you check into people, those sorts of things. And again, after Kansas had done all that, they had decided it's not worth, you know, bringing him to campus and extending that or continuing to extend that scholarship. Now, again, he signed with Kansas a month ago, so it's not technically pulling his scholarship, but I guess, I guess it is technically, but you know, it's, it's sort of a semantics thing, but he was set to be on campus. He's not going to be allowed to be on KU's football team anymore. And yeah, if, if KU went in and did their research and found that uh, he had caused that damage or that there was reason to believe that, then uh, you would, would have to think that the, the proper move would just be to, to cut ties and to, to move on. And that's what Kansas did. Well, the fact that three other schools had uh, he'd accepted offers from, was it three other schools, Texas, Southern California? SMU, USC, and Texas, I think, were the three before that. He had committed three other places before Kansas. Right. Okay. All right. Okay, Jesse Newell, good stuff. And uh, let's let's do it again soon. All right. Sounds good, Blair. Thanks. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our Sportsbeat KC production staff of Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Monty Davis, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. Tip of the cap to Jesse Newell for stopping by and talking college sports. Links to his stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, we've got another deal for you. You can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto-renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. And what a time to subscribe. The Royals, it's opening day this week on Thursday. We're in the middle of March Madness, and of course, it's never not chief season. How do you get it? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional 
national news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at accounts.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And if you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, you just send me an email, bkirkoff at kcstar.com, and I will get you to the right place. So whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting in supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports Beat KC. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Tuesday with another episode.